Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming to Honors Presents Night. We begin by, by acknowledging with honor and respect the indig indigenous nations on whose traditional territories the university now stands and whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. We also acknowledge the elders past and present, including MSU's current Council of the Elders, and humbly ask for their guidance. The Valley of the Flowers has been and remains at a place of learning for Native American peoples who for millennia have passed ways of knowing, being, and doing from one generation to the next. While a land acknowledgement is not enough, it is an important social justice and decolonial practice that promotes indigenous visibility and a reminder that we are on settled indigenous lands. Since January of 2010, Dr. Wadeg Cruzado has served as the 12th president of Montana State University. During her tenure, she has significantly reshaped the face and the future of the state's first land grant and premier university. An articulate and inspirational speaker on the role of the public university, President Cruzado is well known for her understanding of the Morrill Act of 1862, the congressional bill that created the land-grant university system. She is a passionate champion of the land-grants university tripartite mission of education, research and public outreach, as well as the crucial role higher education plays in the development of individuals and the prosperity of the nation. Montana State has set new student enrollment records under President Cruzado's leadership, becoming one of the fastest growing universities in the nation and the pre premier university in the state. Montana State University has led the state in terms of gains in student retention and graduation rates. The number of presidential scholarships has almost quadrupled during President Cruzado's tenure and the university has registered impressive gains in national scholarships. Becoming one of the top institutions in the nation in the number of Goldwater Scholarship recipients. President Cruzado has provided new pathways to higher education with the establishment of Gallatin College MSU and she obtained approval to designate the Honors Program as the Honors College. MSU also won a grant for the, for the Launchpad, a program that introduces entrepreneur, entrepreneurship as a viable career option and provides university students and alumni with support for entrepreneurial ventures. President Cruzado has also enhanced alumni and community relations. One visible community project is the Catwalk an annual celebration of the relationship between MSU and the community. President Cruzado has chaired the board of the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, the oldest association of higher education in the nation. She also chaired the board of HERS, a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting women leaders and equal voice in the future of higher education. She has served on the boards of the American Council on Education and TIAA Hispanic Advisory Board, among others. Her awards include the Hero Award from the National Alliance on Mental Illness, Montana Chapter, the Chief Executive HR Champion Award from the College and University Professional Association for Human Resources, and the Michael P. Malone Educator of the Year from the Montana Ambassadors. She was also recognized as a Paul Harris Fellow by Rotary International and was awarded the Seaman A. Knapp Memorial Lectureship. President Cruzado previously served as Executive Vice President and Provost at New Mexico State University. A native of Puerto Rico, she has a son and a daughter and two granddaughters. Please welcome President Wadev Cruzado. Naomi. Good afternoon, everybody. I mean, let's, let's try this again. Thank you so much, Naomi. Good afternoon, everybody. Ah, that is much better. Thank you so much for this kind invitation. Coming from the students, it's, it's truly an honor. Um, I was telling Dr. Hayes, Dean Hayes, I always enjoy when students invite me to come to class because 
this is this is where I came from, right? I I did not grow up thinking about being a university president. In fact, if you had told me as recently as 20 years ago that I was going to end up serving as a university president in Montana, I would have looked at you with very puzzled eyes. That was, that was not my plan at all. My plan was I discovered books, I fell in love with reading, and therefore I pursued a career where I could devote my entire life to reading books and to sharing with others what I had learned, right? So that's why I became, yeah, I decided to go to college and graduate from college. The accent, uh, if I had a mic, I would have blamed it on the mic. I would have said it's the mic. The accent comes from Puerto Rico. Uh, that's where I was born and raised. Any of you have been to Puerto Rico? There you go, excellent. So Puerto Rico, it's an island in the Caribbean Sea with a total area of 100 miles by 35 miles. That's it. By my back of the envelope calculations, the area, or Puerto Rico, would fit in the area of the state of Montana about 42 times. And yet, we have one million people in Montana, and we have 3.5 million people in the island. That gives you an idea about the density. I was born and raised in a city in the western coast called Mayagüez. And uh, it's claim to fame it's that it is the home of the land-grant university of, the, of, of Puerto Rico. Yet, no one in my family had had an opportunity to go to college. I'm the first person in my family to go to college. And I always think, and I always say, what's the difference between my parents and my grandparents, right, and me? Because my parents were very hardworking people. My mother was so intelligent. I wish you would have met her. So it's not intelligence, it's not hard work, the difference, right? The difference is something very different. Someone gave me an opportunity. Someone opened that door, right? And that opportunity changed my life changed the life of my family, changed the life of our community. And that is where the passion comes from, right? I am convinced that my job is to ensure that no other talented, young, hardworking individual like my mother or my father is ever deprived of an opportunity of going to college. Because I can tell you, college education changes lives. It will transform your life forever. So, today we wanted to make sure that uh, we talked about leadership. So, that was the invitation. Let's talk about leadership. And um, I thought, so what's my most favorite book? My most favorite book is this one, The Leadership Challenge. I don't know if you, any of you have seen it before. Coses and pa Posner. Why do I like this book over others? And I read a leadership book at least every six months, a different book with the executive team, so that we can learn a little bit more. And uh, the reason why I like this book, it's because it's, it is based on research. It is an empirical study that has been going on for over 30 years that says, that asks, what do leaders do when they are at their best. And after 30 years, here's what the research says. When leaders are at their best, they have been able to identify five practices. And I'm going to read them first, and then we're going to talk a little bit about each of them, and then we'll open it for questions. Is that okay? Okay. So, it says, when leaders are at their best, number one, they model the way. 
Number two, when leaders are at, the, at their best, they inspire a shared vision. When leaders are at their best, they challenge the process. Fourth, when leaders are at their best, they enable others to act. And fifth, when leaders are at their best, they encourage the heart. Let's talk about that very quickly about each of them, and perhaps I can uh, include some examples here and there. First of all, when leaders are effective, it's because, first of all, they model the way. We have heard this before, right? It's when leaders practice what they preach. When there's no difference between their words and their actions. I compare that to my passion for the land grant university, which you have heard me talk about. So when we think about it, it was just the other day that higher education in America was transformed. If you go to the 19th century, as recently as the 19th century, mid 19th century, 1850s, Higher education was still being conducted in America in exactly the same model as the old European colleges and universities. What does that mean? Colleges and universities back then were still, for the most part, private. Colleges and universities had very narrow academic portfolios, right? Just offering medicine, theology, and law. And colleges and universities were reserved for people coming from very wealthy families, particularly men. And yet, we had all these problems in the new nation in the 1850s. We had all this land, but we did not know how to cultivate the land. We did not have the engineering fundamentals to build ourselves the roads, the bridges, right? So along came this man. He was a congressman. His name was Justin Smith Moore from Vermont. And he proposed a new revolutionary novel idea. He said, let's open one public university. That's new. But when we talk about boldness and vision in leaders, and he said, let's open one public university in each state and territory of the Union for the purpose of educating the sons and daughters of the working families of America. That is a populist notion. That was absolutely revolutionary. It was so extravagant that it was voted down twice. And finally, that piece of legislation passed on July the 2nd, 1862. That was just the other day, 160 years ago. It's the first time in the history of congressional documents in which we include the word daughters, in which we open the doors to all to have access to higher education and to transform in their lives. And oh, what a great lesson that it happened right in the middle of a civil war. When we had every type of excuse not to pass it. Not now, let's wait for the war to be over, right? But rather than focusing on that difficult moment as a nation, we envision a better and brighter future by educating the citizenry. And fast forward 160 years later, you and I are part of that promise, right? So when I talk about this, it's important for me to model the way. It's not, doesn't just cut it if I just talk about this and do, do something about it. And that is why your university has been growing by leaps and bounds. 
inviting extraordinary students like you, but also making sure that we invite students who don't think of themselves as college material, who haven't had an opportunity to envision themselves in a different role. And that's why, for example, seven years ago we created the Hilleman Scholars, which is an extraordinary program where we go around the state of Montana, we identified first generation students who are not thinking about coming to college, people that are uh, extension program identify, and we invite them to come to Montana State. You know, we invite them to come to Montana State and we gave them very high standards. We asked them that they're going to come, that they're going to graduate in four years, that they're going to help their peers. And these are not the 4.0 students. But you know what has been happening? Those students are retained, they persist at a higher rate than the average student at Montana State University. For the first cohort that we had, not all of them graduated in four years. Actually, we had three who did not graduate in four years because they graduated in three and a half. And the three are men. One of them just came to see us the other day. He's now finishing medicine at Michigan State University. That other MSU. But see, these are the things that we can do when we model the way. When I say, I believe in access to higher education, we work together, we open doors for others. Secondly, when leaders are at their best, they inspire a shared vision. Inspire a shared vision. Notice that I didn't say they push down your throat their own ideas, right? It's easy to order, to make orders. It's very difficult to persuade, to move people, to inspire them, to make them believe that they can accomplish great things, right? And to do it together. One leadership challenge that I had when I first arrived at Montana State. Well, I can very quickly talk about two of very different natures. Number one, when I first was announced as president of Montana State, you can imagine the reaction with some folks. What? A woman from Puerto Rico. They don't, we don't play American football in Puerto Rico. That was a tragedy, right? And so, six months into my job, I had to meet with all these alumni who were upset that we were not going to support football, right? And I met with them, 200 of them, 200 men, 200 very big men, 200 very big, angry men. Boy, they were upset. And, uh, you know, I let them talk. I let them whine and protest for about an hour. And then at the end, I said, I, I hear you. I hear your concerns, but that's in the past. And I'm more interested in the future. Can we, can we talk about, you know, tearing down those wooden bleachers that we have there? And what about if we were to build a new end zone in concrete? And what about if we have more space for our students? more concessions, um, more bathrooms. And I said, and what about if we become the first university in the state to have permanent lights in the stadium and we make all of it happen before the next Cats Grizz game? You know what happened? All of them stood up, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I was not thinking properly when I said that. But you know, we ended up raising, we wanted to raise $8 million. We ended up raising 11 and building that stadium, that end zone in 10 months flat. And as important as we think that is for me, the most important thing is that it brought us together and that it demonstrated that we can accomplish great things when we work together. Another one, 
American Indian Hall. Incredible building, incredible concept. Established in 2005, by the time I arrived in 2010, we had been raising money for five years. We needed $8 million. We had raised $400,000. And we started to raise money. It was hard. It was very hard. Because not everybody believed in that project, right? So how, how was I able to inspire alumni and others, right? About this shared vision, about a beautiful building that could honor our past, but also be a point of encounter for all our students today. And um, it was very hard to raise $8 million. We failed at that. But one day, I uh, met a, a lady who was not even a student of Montana State University. And she gave us $12 million. And inspired by that, then we were able to raise an additional eight. Because now people were inspired, right, about this shared vision. When leaders are at their best, number three, they challenge the process. This is very cool. I love this one. And I ask you to do that. When you start your work, please ask people why. Why do we do things this way? And I don't know if this has happened to you already. When people look at you and say, because we have always done it that way. That's the way we have always done it, right? Don't, right? Make sure that you ask good questions, that you empower people around you, and that you can challenge those processes and make them new. And new things will happen. Fourthly, when people are at their best, they allow others to act. What does that mean? Leadership is not about you pushing others. In fact, when I have found in my life that I have been most successful, is when I use four words. Actually, three. I need four. I need your help. I need your help. And you get out of the way. And you will always be surprised at the wonderful things that people will do. And invariably, invariably, things turn out to be far better than my vision. For example, Honors College. It was mentioned before. When I first arrived, we had an Honors honors program, beautiful, great program, small program with a director, right? And we decided to give it a promotion. We needed to have our own honors college. And uh, we went to the Board of Regents, we changed the name, we moved the name from director to a dean. Um, if you have met Ilse Marie Lee, she was the director, and uh, her husband Denny, who we just lost very recently, he had a great sense of humor. He told me one day, President, I thank you for the title of Dean. In reality, we needed to call her Duchess. <laughs> and what happened was, I got out of the way. I enabled others to act. You know what happened? Then, we identified this incredible alum by the name of Norm S. Bjornsson. And I went to see Norm, and I said, what about if we had a new building for engineering? But not only for engineering. I said, we want to open that building for all the majors, nursing students, business students, everybody can have a place there, and we can move our honors college there, because our honors college didn't have a place, right? And guess what? We had that idea. Ilsa built it with inviting more and more extraordinary students. And let's take a look at the honors college today. 
This is the largest honors college in the entire state of Montana. I happen to feel very, very proud of it. And I'm happy to say, I did not make it happen. You guys made it happen. We enabled you to act. And the last thing that we do when we're um, leaders. Oh, thank you. Yeah. When leaders are at their best, is that we encourage the heart. My dear students, work is hard. Leadership is hard, but following is even harder. It's important for us to take time in our days to pause and to celebrate others in public. That is so meaningful, right? When you touch someone in the shoulder, when you say to others, hey, today, Naomi did a wonderful thing, right? And, the, and you say it, and it's at the beginning, people get startled and they don't want to be called out. But that day, right, you will see that Naomi will go back home and say, hey, today, my boss said this and this about me. Encourage the heart. That's why we created this this tiny little program that we called um, Pure Gold. Pure Gold, celebrate those who excel. It's a very democratic uh, program. You just need to identify. Is there a faculty, a student, a staff who have gone beyond their call of duty to help you? Right? Write us a paragraph. Send us a photo and tell us why you think that Cassidy is pure gold. We have a committee, and then guess what? We have that email, we prepare an email, and we send it to every faculty, student, and staff in all our four campuses, all our 55 county extension office, and everybody in our seven agricultural centers. Everybody knows about it. And what happens is, invariably, those individuals start getting bombarded and receiving words of congratulations, right? And that's how you keep that energy and that momentum within the organization. And you recognize those individuals who are really the ones who do the hard work and who transform things. So that's the essence of this book. And I want to end with this anecdote, because it might happen to some of you. I mentioned before, I never planned to be a university president. I was perfectly happy being in the classroom. And one thing led to the next, right? And then you're invited to serve in this committee, and you're invited to do this work, and little by little, one good day, everything happened, and uh, from my native Puerto Rico, the island of enchantment, I ended up moving to New Mexico State as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. When I first landed in New Mexico, anybody here from New Mexico? Anyone has been to New Mexico? Good. So you know that in order to get to New Mexico, you fly to El Paso, most likely, if you're going to Las Cruces, I mean, and um, you drive 45 miles to New Mexico. And then there is this yellow, beautiful yellow road sign that says, Welcome to New Mexico, the land of enchantment. So from the island of enchantment to the land of enchantment, I thought I was crossing the twilight zone, right? And uh, that was my plan. I became uh, uh, dean and provost, and I thought I was going to stay there. And then, one thing led to the other. I became dean, I became provost, and one good day I became president, interim president of New Mexico State University. And while I'm doing that job, a headhunter called from Montana State University. First call, 
I still remember, this was April 2009, and he said, uh, I wanted for you to know that we're opening a search for Montana State University. President Jeff Gamble just retired, and we would like to have a conversation with you. And I said, thank you very much. I really appreciate it, but I hate moving. So, thank you. And I hung up. About a month later, he called again. And he said, we wanted for you to know that you have been nominated for a position and we would like to have a conversation with you. And I was like, wait a minute. From Puerto Rico, which is what, 98% Latina, to New Mexico, which was about half of that, 48% or so. I wonder, I said, what, what's the Latino population in Montana? Right? <laughs> so I went, to, <laughs> I went to the Census Bureau page. This was 2009. You can still look it up. 2%. So I wrote this email and I said, thank you very much. But this is not a good fit for me at this time in my career. And the phone rang. And guess who it was? <laughs> it's this guy again. By then I'm pretty exasperated. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, right? There's no way. And I told him, listen, I have never been to Montana. When I think about Montana, I think about horses and mountains, and snow. And by the way, do you know where, I, where I'm from? I don't look like, I don't sound like anybody in Montana. And I remember lowering my head and asking him, what do you see in me that I'm not seeing? Because in my head I was thinking, a woman, a Latina speaks with an accent, five feet tall, background in comparative literature. No, 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 no. And what he said was, what we see in you is your experience with land-grant universities, your passion for underrepresented minorities, and we're looking for someone with a lot of energy. And then I said, well, on that topic. Right? So, each and every one of you has incredible talents. Make sure you put them to good use. Make sure that when that phone call comes in your life, when that invitation, when that person comes knocking at your door, I want for you to always, always, always say yes. Even if you feel that you're not ready, even if you feel that you're unprepared, to my girls particularly, women are very hard on themselves. We're never as confident as our counterparts. You have inside of you everything you need to go out and accomplish extraordinary things. Use those five practices, but the most important thing is be yourself. Be yourself, be generous, be confident, and transform the world. Go cats! Any questions, comments? Anything you have for me? We have time. Do we have time? Good. Excellent. Quite time for Anything you want to share with me. It's not every day that I get to be with my students and particularly with this wonderful group of students. Yes? What was one of your biggest challenges, like being the first generation, like first person in your family going to college? Mm, that's an excellent, that's an excellent question. My, my biggest challenge is that everything is new. Everything is new and everything is unknown. And there are what they call, they're, they're, <clears throat> they call it the, hit, the hidden curriculum, right? There are conventions, there are, there are rules um, that you are not aware of. That's why I try to instill in, in, in our staff, even though sometimes, let's say you work, 
pick up, pick any office, right? And that's why our staff are so fantastic. Because if you go to the registrar and you're doing this work for many, many years, it's important for us to keep that information fresh. What is a W, right? What do you mean? I didn't know anything, anything. And then, once you are a first generation student, you're a first generation professional too. You don't know those conventions either. And there's another thing. Even, I am convinced that even till the day she died, my mother was very proud of me, but she never understood what I did for a living, <laughs> right? And let me share a very personal anecdote with you um, on the topic of what is very different or very difficult when you're a first generation. My mother was diagnosed uh, with cancer when she was 64 years old. She received treatment. Um, the cancer went away. And four years later, a different cancer came. So by then, she had had chemo, she had had radio. She knew what was coming. And she said, I'm not doing this again. And you know how we have these conversations about respecting others, people, choices? Uh-huh. Until it's your mother. Right? So I flew to see her, and I sat down with her. We're having coffee in the morning, and I'm begging her to have treatment. And, um, and he said, Mom, let's, let's take this one day at a time. I know it's hard, but let's take it one day at a time. And she said, it's easy for you to say. And I thought that what she was saying is, it's easy for me to say because I'm not undergoing the treatment. You know what she told me? He said, what do you mean? Is it, it's easy for you to say that because you have studied. I never went to college. And at that moment, I understood. For her, the opportunity of going to college had afforded me, and she was right, a shield and armor to confront realities, to survive challenges and adversity that she didn't have. So, on the topic of what's the most difficult thing when you're a first generation, let's never forget all the blessings that come with every conquered obstacle, right? Every day, every test, every exam, for me, it was a big celebration. <clears throat> there was this biology course where the faculty member was famous <clears throat> for being horrible. <clears throat> So, usually it was a class of 45 students and no more than 10 would survive. Literally. But you know what? What I learned? First of all, I went to learn to his office. He only spoke English. Classes were in Spanish. His was in English. And I still remember talking about the Krebs cycle and the word trigger came up and I did not understand what trigger was. Right? And I, we, I would go to, to, his <clears throat> to his office and I would start having this conversation. That is the best piece of advice that I give my students. Go see your faculty at the, at the office hours. Sit down, engage in conversation. I studied more for a biology test than for my own major. I would start, working on a test two weeks in advance, unheard of for me. You know what? And at the end of the semester, I got an A. I got an A! <laughs> so, the last question that I'm going to tap on that. It's very normal for us to think about, tell me about the challenges that you have confronted. People ask me, have people ever discriminated against you? You know what? And I really mean it. I don't know. 
because that's not how I think. I don't focus on the negative. I'm sure that some people might, but it doesn't good, do good to my soul. It kills me. Right? So, when we think about the challenges, always think about the opportunities that you will be able to find. And uh, you'll do great things. Even though you're from Missoula, you'll do fantastic things. <laughs> you had a question here. Uh, yes. Um, Jacob. What is the most like unexpected or surprising challenge you've encountered being president at MCU? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. You know what? <clears throat> I remember coming for my interview, and um, this was a full day of interviews. And the way they structure it, you will have the faculty uh, meeting. Then you will move to a different room with the students, uh, and then a different room with the department heads. And uh, When I met with the students, I still remember walking in that room from the back. Students are already sitting down. And seeing all these beautiful, blonde, red-haired, ski-wearing attire. And I was like, holy mackerel. What am I doing here? Right? And to this day, to this day, that was the most difficult session in that those were the best questions I fielded in my entire uh, interview. And that sealed the deal for me. I wanted to be in a university with students that were so aware of their environment um, that they were not afraid Right, of reaching out on that topic of that day. Then I, meet, I, uh, I met with the department heads. And at the end, I saw that there was this guy standing up at the end of the room. And uh, that was the last question. And he said, um, in every group there is a curmudgeon, and I'm the one for this group. My name is Walter Fleming. I'm the director of Native, <laughs> of Native American Studies. And I just have one question for you. If you come here, if, if an offer is made, would you come here and will you be happy? Boy, that is the question. It's not the title. It's not the position. It's will you be happy? And I have been so happy. On that day, third session, that was very important. There's a community event. It's full. And uh, at the end of it, there is the local reporter. You don't know her because she has retired since. <clears throat> the local reporter, a little bit of background, when my name was announced, she called me at New Mexico State University. And this is a true story. Right off the bat, the first question when I pick up the phone was, is it true you're just feet, five feet tall? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then she asked all these other questions, and then towards the end, she finished. And then she went to the proverbial, have you ever been discriminated because you're a woman, because you're a Latina, and blah, all these things. But she went back to, are you really five feet tall? And I said, listen, I have this poster of Garfield the cat, and it says, I'm short, and I, stay to st I intend to stay that way. <laughs> so at the fast forward, then I meet her in person at the community group, and she approaches me. And I, first of all, I noticed, She's not that much taller than I am. <laughs> but she asked me Walter's question with a different spin. She said, if they make an offer to you, will you come? Because Montana is very different from New Mexico. And you belong more in a place like New Mexico 
or Florida or a Spanish-speaking place, not Montana. I almost punched her on the <laughs> nose, <laughs> but I decided not to. <laughs> and right after that, I called the, search, the chair of the search committee, and I put my name out of the search. I said, I don't need this in my life. Right? And he said, no, no, let's, let's sit down and talk. Right? And it would have been a monumental mistake for me to pull out. And not a day goes by that I am not grateful to the people of the state of Montana who have afforded me this incredible opportunity. Someone who doesn't look like a lot of people here who doesn't sound like. But, you know, I think that this is like a tacit covenant. I know, I knew, I had to work very hard so that in the future, there are other minority uh, presidents. There are other women who accept that call. But all the credit goes to the people of the, of the state who said, we're going we're gonna to give her this chance. And the same thing will happen to you. That's why I'm saying, never say no. People see things in you that you are not seeing, but you can do extraordinary things. Yeah? Uh, do you have any other book recommendations? Oh, I have tons of books <laughs> recommendations. Uh, remember, I told you, it's comparative literature. Yeah. On, on the topic of, um, of leadership, if we're talking leadership, just to say, Best book ever, it's 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, but that's separate. Um, actually, he now, has been, he now has surpassed Miguel de Cervantes' uh, Don Quixote as the most read book in the world and the most tr translated author. So, Garcia Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude, great book. Invite me back if you read it and we'll discuss it. But on the topic of, of how to manage groups, there's another book that I use a lot. It's, called, it's by Patrick Lencioni. Patrick Lencioni is a best-selling author. He has books that perhaps you have heard, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, Death by Meeting, etc. But he has this little book that it's called The Advantage. And what I love about The Advantage, it's that it's a compilation of his five best-selling books. Sans anecdotes, just, just the most important things. And uh, he tells us several things, but first of all, the importance of clarity, right? Sometimes groups don't move ahead because people don't know exactly what their lane is, what they expect. So how to every day, and I say this, every day there are three things I need to do. Communicate, 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 right? So that there is clarity. And uh, on the topic of death by meeting, we were doing everything. We were doing the retreats, we were doing the one hour uh, tactical meetings, uh, monthly uh, generative or strategic meetings. But then he proposes this, have a daily 10, long, 10 minute meeting standing up. And um, when I proposed that to the executive team, we were in a retreat in uh, Silly Lake, and they almost, almost threw me in the lake because they thought it was a horrible idea. And we have been doing that for 12 years now. That's how we start our day. The only thing I added was an, uh, something from Phil Knight, and, and that is we stand in a circle and we go around the horn and we just say what's going on in our lives, sometimes what's going on in our hearts, in 10 minutes and they need to get out of the, of the office. What that has done is, first of all, it allows us to know each other better, what each of us do. It has instilled this sense of team and guess what? They, the group meets even if I'm not on campus. That's the ultimate 
vote of confidence, right? And Lencioni, it's a great book. Last question. Yeah? With all the stuff that's been happening on campus recently, is there anything that you would like the student body to, like, for lack of a better term, embody more or embrace or in some way change? Oh my gosh! That is a wonderful question. With everything that is going on on campus, um, there, there's a lot of things going on on campus. What I want for you to know is that we work very hard to protect you. Each and every one of you. Our mission is to educate, but I need for you to feel, to feel that you are in a safe environment. At the same time, sometimes, I need to do things that are not the most evident ones to protect you. I have never been one to feed the troll. I have never been one to amplify messages that are meant with ulterior motives. I can tell you this, I have, I always come to work with my open hands, placing students first, always. What can you do? If you ever have a question, if you ever have a concern, come to see me. The doors of my office are always open, always. My staff knows that. When a student comes, that's the most important thing. If you have a question, if you do not understand, if you have a recommendation, I said it before, if you have a joke, if you have a piece of gossip, just stop my, by my office. This is the most wonderful thing that we have in this campus. In my native Puerto Rico, students are very social. In New Mexico, students were very good, but they were more Timon, when I arrive in this blessed place, starting with that interview, and even now, one of my points of pride is that students will see me walking around campus and it will be like, hi, President Cruzado. Hello, good morning, President Cruzado. Can I walk with you to the office? Do that. Don't, don't fall prey to rumors. I don't need to tell you, you're bright students. But if you ever have any questions, just come to see me. You will always have my attention, my time, my energy, and I always, always will tell you the truth. Always. But that's how we build community. The last thing I will say, we want to keep you safe, but I also need to pre prepare you for the world for a world in which I need for you to be resilient and strong. When we are not there by your side to protect you. Right? And I cannot allow you to get distracted with minutia because I need you. Montana needs you. The world needs you. We need for you to get prepared and to give all your wonderful talents back. So, it's for that question. I love you. I hope, I hope you understand that, right? I love each and every one of you. More questions? Yes? What time do you wake up? What time do I wake up? <laughs> well, there's, a, there's one part that you don't know about me. I have dogs. <laughs> How many? How many? How many dogs do I have? Five. Well, you missed by one. I have four. Well, how do I end up with four dogs? Okay. So, the first one is a toy poodle. The toy poodle is almost 12 years old. The 12 poodle came to me thanks to a student of Montana State. So that student was in the band my first year. And um, Adrian, was one of those students, great students, who had 
steel spikes coming out of his ears, like that, right? a tomahawk. And um, he was very talented, but he did not like to study. So several times he stopped by my office, just like what we've been talking, to let me know that he was dropping out of Montana State. And we would have these conversations, why? Right? We did that several times for, for two years. And then one good day he comes to my office and he says, guess what? I said, what? And he says, I'm graduating. And I was like, whoa, that's awesome. And then he says, I am so grateful that I want to give you a gift. I said, you don't need to give me a gift. This is my job. I said, and then he really blindsided me. He said, do you like dogs? He said, I love dogs. I always had a dog. And he said, my mom raises toy poodles. So we have one for you. I said, oh, you don't, you don't need to do that. I mean, and I was so embarrassed. And, oh. and, then, and then I said, no, thank you, but, but no. And when I said no, his face, right? He melted, and I almost, oh my gosh, I was like, oh my gosh, what I have done? And he said, can my mom give you a call? Sure, absolutely. Well, guess what? My mom, his mom called me one day, and same thing, from Texas. And she's like, we're so grateful, blah, blah, and we have this dog for you. And I try to extricate myself from that situation. I don't know if this has happened to you, that sometimes you say one or two more words than what you needed to say, and I said, I, I really appreciate it, but I am so busy this semester, and after I said this semester, I wanted to tell <laughs> But by then, it was too late. And she said, oh, honey, don't worry. We'll send him for Christmas. <laughs> so that's Blanco. Then, um, I had a beagle before, when I first arrived here. The beagle passed. The first thing was, the beagle was too lonely, so I went to the heart of the valley and I got another beagle um, who had severe mental issues. But I discovered that too late. I brought the beagle to the house and the first thing she did, she attacked my other beagle. But I could not return her now. I remember, I'm the new president of Montana State University. You don't want to have a front line, a headline in the Bozeman Daily Chronicle, heartless new president of Montana State. <laughs> right, so that was Lucy. Um, Lucy passed, and so I got Mia from Heart of the Valley, who's a Montana border collie mix. She belongs in the Honors College. <laughs> he, he, she's so smart. And then last year, my son, who has Frenchies, had um, had a leader. They thought that they were going to have four. They ended up with eight. Mm -hmm. So somehow I came back with two Frenchies. <laughs> so the four of them wake me up before six in the morning. They tell me when do I need to go to bed, right? If I have, if I'm hosting people, in the house, they come out and they look dismissively at the guests if it's 10 o'clock. Don't you know what time is it? She needs to go to bed. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, uh, but it's a lot of fun. You need to come and meet them one day. <laughs> Listen, guys, this has been a wonderful conversation. And uh, I'm so proud of you. I really mean it. You're amazing. Come to see me if, you, if there's anything I can do for you. And uh, if not, I look forward to seeing you. I'm sure I will at commencement time when I hand that diploma to you. Go Cats. Love you. Thanks for having me.